be. Good afternoon, bonjour, uh, tout le monde, bonjour. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Canadian Labour Congress. Yes, your Canadian Labour Congress. I'm pleased to bring you greetings from the CLC officers, our President Hassan Youssef and Vice Presidents Marie Clark Walker and Donald Lafleur, also from our staff and from our 3.3 million members of the Canadian Labour Congress, women and men working in your communities from coast to coast to coast. It's my privilege this afternoon to introduce our guest speaker for this session, Richard Trumka. Richard Trumka is the president of the AFL-CIO, the largest labour federation in the United States, the CLC's sister federation. He was the AFL-CIO secretary-treasurer for 15 years and then was elected president in 2009 and re-elected in 2013. When I asked Rich last night what he'd like included in his introduction, he said, I want you to make sure that they know that I am proud of my roots, that I'm a third generation coal miner, and I want you to know that Richard Trumka has not lost contact with workers on the shop floor or in the mines. <laughs> Under sustained attack by Conservatives of the United States, organized labour is striving to do things differently. Richard Trumka is leading that change. Now we all know that the right wing shares strategies, and we know that we must too if we're going to advance labour and human rights for all citizens. The AFL and the CLC have a long history of working together and learning together. We value our friendship, we value our solidarity. The challenges faced on one side of our borders are often manifested on the other side of the border. So it's good to share ideas, to learn about lessons, to build a stronger labour movement, to support families and the communities that they live in. It is an honour to welcome Brother Trumka to Canada to hear his perspectives on moving our progressive movements forward and to let you know as well that his presentation will be followed by an on-stage response panel. Brothers and sisters, consoeurs et confrères, please... Brothers and sisters... ...the president of the AFL-CIO, Richard Trumka, back to Canada and to this exciting event. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you, Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Barb, for that uh, very, very kind and generous introduction. I have to tell you, it's good to be back in Canada. I don't get here enough, but I'm always happy when I do. And once again, I want to say thank you for having me. Uh, before I begin, I want to thank the Broadbent Institute and particularly your chairman, Ed Broadbent, uh, for inviting me to this important discussion uh, about why the labor movement must lead the progressive fight. I have to tell you, I'm really excited about the subject because I believe it will lead our labor unions and our coalition of allies and progressive partners toward a new era of broadly shared prosperity and to an economy that works for all and not just a chosen few. Now, I think the work of your unions are, are doing here in Canada and your political and community organizing are not only critical, but they're absolutely essential. Now, I've learned something about your growing working centers and the way that you're addressing issues specific to women among your First Nations and with young workers. Earlier this month, the AFL-CIO held its third Next Up Young Workers Summit. It was in Chicago, and it was uh, the best one yet. And I'm so glad to learn of the growing power of young workers in Canada. And to those young workers, I want to say, 
not only keep up the good work because we, it's good to do, but we need you because we can't survive and we can't prosper without you. So I want to say thanks. And to get there, it's actually so very important for us to return to the core ideas of unionism. You see, our unions lift workers up, not just some, but all. And the more a group of workers is down, the more a group of workers is hurting, the harder that we have to fight, the harder we have to organize, and the harder that we have to advocate, because we are all truly connected. Now, I'd like to say a few words about the big new trade agreements our countries are proposing because they will have a dramatic impact on the lives of working people in both our countries. Today, everybody knows how bad trade agreements have hollowed out our national economies and have helped to stagnate wages. And let me be clear about this. In fact, let me be very clear about this. Uh, I'm not against trade deals, but I'm very much against bad trade deals. But I'm optimistic that our labor movements can work together uh, to end a provision that's on the table in both countries right now. It's called ISDS, uh, which stands for the Investor State Dispute Settlement. And the ISDS is a secret tribunal uh, where investors can challenge and override laws and regulations of democratically elected governments. And that provision, that provision threatens our environment, our food safety, labor rights, human rights, and much more. Now, nobody should get a secret tribunal. Working people don't. No one else does. We have this clunky, old, slow process. Uh, in fact, it's been very, very ineffective in places like Colombia, where 73 trade unionists were murdered in three years after the labor action plan that our government adopted uh, was put in place. Now, that's a tragedy. And that's terrible. And anyone with a lick of common sense can tell you that not only are those killings a human rights catastrophe, but they're driving down wages and workplace standards in Colombia and in every country that trades with Colombia. And that's in part why it's so important to be standing in solidarity with the labor, Canadian labor movement, with your progressive community, to demand that ISDS be taken out of our proposed deals and out of CETA. Because it's a bad provision, it places the value of an investor's dollar over the lives of working people. It's offensive, it's wrong, and I can tell you, we will stand against the for as long as we need to take it out of our agreements. Now, our work against bad trade policy in the United States and our collaboration with you here are part of a large overarching strategy in our labor movement to raise wages. You see, ending these bad trade deals will help us set the stage to raise wages. And we want to raise wages for all working people because so much of what's wrong in our economy stems from the disconnect between pay and productivity. You see, in the United States, wages have been stagnant for over a decade. In fact, between 1997 and 2012, the income of those in the bottom 90 percent 
fell by $3,000. Now, that happened even as our productivity rose. And this is just not a problem for individual families. Economists everywhere agree that flat wages hurt our economies and they depress demand. Now, the U.S. labor movement is working to enact minimum wage hikes and fair overtime rules and earn sick leave and to eliminate wage inequality between women who earn just 70 cents, 77 cents on a dollar uh, with men and to provide child care and a lot of other very, very progressive policy initiatives to raise wages in America. And at the city level and state level, our labor organizations have partnered with community allies to make all kinds of positive change. In Los Angeles, for example, we've partnered with environmentalists and business groups and a dozen others to win investments in massive infrastructure projects that not only create jobs, but a more sustainable environment. In Seattle, we helped lead a coalition to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. San Francisco now has a new Retail Workers' Bill of Rights, and organizations like Jobs with Justice have been pivotal from coast to coast and across the country, and we've won local rules against wage theft, and we've made progress on many, many other important issues. Now, these local alliances have also transformed politics by electing true progressives in places as different as Los Angeles and Nebraska, uh, and many, many places in between, in fact, too many for me to name. Now, on a national level, our unions have partnered with groups of workers at Walmart and fast food workers to fight for better pay and better working conditions, and those workers have started to win. And I gotta tell you, I've been on both sides of that equation, and I like winning a whole lot more than I like losing. <laughs> and the strength and the courage of those workers is one of the most exciting things uh, in the United States right now. And I can tell you, the entire labor movement is proud to stand with them. Now, we know from experience, we know the single best way for working people to get and to keep a raise is by asking for one with a collective voice. And that's why it's important for every worker to be able to have a union on the job and be able to get that union without being threatened and fired and discriminated against. You see, the International Monetary Fund, last time I looked, they were hardly considered a leftist group, and the OECD recently released studies tying rising inequality to the attacks on collective bargaining. You see, it's up to us to make a change, and it's up to us to change ourselves. The vision of raising wages and the broader idea of dignity and decency that raising wages represents can really unite a broad, broad range of organizations. It'll help us grow a bigger coalition because you see, raising wages is one link that binds social and economic justice. For instance, our campaigns to end mass incarceration and to win comprehensive immigration reform uh, with a pathway to citizenship are examples and are central to our work to raise wages. It's not only the right thing to do and the moral thing to do, 
But these are also work issues. See, 11 million workers, American in every way but on paper, are easily denied fundamental workplace rights and decent wages because unscrupulous employers call the immigration cops when a worker tries to organize, when a worker tries to point out an unsafe work condition, when a worker demands minimum wage, they get sent away. You know the sad thing in my country? That very thing happens in the very shadows of our U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. And I have to tell you, that's wrong. And it's up to us to right that wrong. Now, see, brothers and sisters, the United States is a nation of immigrants. We're built by immigrants. We remain an immigrant nation today. And I happen to believe in the immigrant dream of coming to America to work hard and get ahead and to build a better life. And my union values tell me that I should celebrate that dream. And I should make that dream real for as many people as possibly can be. See, when it comes to mass incarceration, When it comes to mass incarceration, one in 15 black men in the, is in the U.S. prison system today. One in 15. While fewer than one in 100 white men are in the system, even though black men and white men commit crimes at roughly the same rate. Now, this is not only unjust, it's really tearing our communities apart. And you see it rise up in place after place. See, we're criminalizing a huge population of black men, and the practice is suppressing wages, because millions of people who have served their time remain locked out of the job market by employers who screen applicants for felony convictions. In fact, they have a little box on the application. Were you ever convicted of a felony? If you check the box, that's the place they stop reviewing your application and it goes into the trash can. And workers, quite frankly, on all sides of the issue are affected, including police and correction officers whose jobs are made more dangerous by mandatory sentencing laws and prison overcrowding. See, labor rights and social justice and economic justice cannot be separated, cannot be. They cannot be isolated. When your rights are targeted, mine are in danger. We've seen that again and again and again. And that's why the labor movement must lead this progressive fight on these issues. See, we know how to stand together. We know to call injustice out for what it is and to fight to make it right. We know how to rally. We know that when your picket line becomes my picket line and mine becomes yours, that we win. And when we win, we all win. And that's the beauty of a raising wages world. And let me tell you, we're going to win. You see, we're fighting to win. This year in the United States, five million union workers are going to be bargaining contracts. It's the biggest year for bargaining in recent American history, and we're going to raise wages for those five million workers and their families and everybody else that comes in contact with those five million workers. And we're going to
going to do it because we're standing together with union workers, we're standing together with non-union workers, and we're standing together with never heard of union workers yet. We're standing together and we're winning together. See, in one day last month, one day, one 24-hour period, we saw communication workers and electrical workers in New England win raises. We saw communication workers in Brooklyn sign a first contract and with strong, strong wage increases. And we saw 500,000 workers win raises at Walmart and a dozen other retailers since have followed them, the latest one targeted. That was in one 24-hour period, brothers and sisters. That was a good time. About those wins, I'd like to say, if some is good, more is better. And we want more, we want better, we want raising wages for every last worker in our countries. Every last worker. Now, brothers and sisters, if you take away one thing from my talk today, I hope it's this. The interests that we have as working people span all the things that could possibly divide us. And as institutions, our unions span all the things that could possibly divide us. Because for everything that could, one thing that could pull us apart, there's 10,000 things that bring us together and unite us. And nobody and nothing can match the breadth and the scope of our labor unions. You see, when we unite with allies and partners who share our vision and our values, we represent the beliefs, the wants, and the desires of the vast, vast, vast majority of the Canadian and American people. And it is time that their wants, needs, and aspirations go to the front of the bus instead of the back of the bus like they've been for the last three decades. Now, we know that the challenges of working people are legion. We've got political opponents who want to take us out. In the United States, we've got governors falling all over themselves to sign right to work for less laws, to make it harder for working people to bargain for a better life. Here in Canada, you've got politicians who are itching just itching to take the worst policies from the United States and use them on you. And I know you're fighting against bad legislation like C-377 and C-525, two bills that make it harder for unions to organize and bargain. And I know I know in my heart that you will beat back those bills and those challenges from the conservative government. See, we have challenges of many, but we won't let those challenges stop us. We'll use those challenges to unite us and to propel us forward together to an economy that works for all of us and not just an elite few. And I got to tell you, corporate right, right wing just doesn't get it. They're stuck in the past. You see, we're the future. The future for our kids, the future for the young and the aged, the future for our communities, the future for our countries. We're the future. So brothers and sisters, all of this is to say that now, right now, 
Now is a great time to be a trade unionist because because we are engaged in the struggle of our time and the future of our countries needs us and depends on us to step forward together. So while coalition work is hard, it's the best, if not the only way to grow. Because when we stand together, the numbers are on our side. Standing together is how we'll build a strong economy. Raising wages works. It works economically. It works politically. It's the right thing to do. And it'll work for every single one of us and all of you and for our whole society. So this is our day. This is our time, our rights, our voice, our power, our countries. Canada needs you. It needs you to stand together, to win together, because we can do better and we will do better together. So declare with me today that we will march for it, we'll fight for it, we'll organize for it, we'll mobilize for it, and we will vote for it. We'll keep building and winning, winning a better future for us and our kids and their kids together today, together tomorrow, and together for as long as it takes to build a Canada that works for every last working Canadian. God bless you and keep up the good work. My name is Nathan Robin. I'm the uh, Political Action Director at the Canadian Labour Congress. I, I want to thank uh, Richard Trumka for his excellent remarks. Uh, uh, should I just give him another round of applause? It was really wonderful to hear a lot about some of the successes, some of the challenges that they face in the in the U.S. and how we can work together to uh, to, to to solve some of those challenges that we all face uh, together. Uh, this panel will uh, will focus on responding to some of those challenges, uh, in particular some of the legislative attacks that we face uh, here in the labor movement in Canada, as well as uh, particularly the, the critical issue of how we can organize the unorganized, uh, especially among precarious workers and uh, and young workers in, in Canada. So I'd love to introduce. Uh, my uh, panelists uh, today. Uh, we're going to start. Uh, so we have uh, at, the, at the far end uh, Dina Ladd from the Workers Action Center, uh, Bob Master, the co founder of the Working uh, Families Party, and Kaylee Thiessen, an economist with the CCPA. Uh, we'll start with, with Kaylee. Uh, Kaylee is an economist with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives Ontario office. She researches labor markets, uh, the role of government, and the value of public services. Uh, Kaylee also writes a blog called Jobs Friday, providing monthly updates on short and long-term trends in Ontario's labor market. Kaylee. All right. Hi, everybody. Is the, yeah, we're on. Okay, so my job this afternoon is to provide you with an overview of what's happening in Canada's labor market. Uh, some of that will be repetitive. It's been, we've talked about that a lot already, uh, already today. The first point to make is a huge shocker. The uh, labor market is underperforming for a larger share of Canadians uh, every, every year as time moves on. I know, shocker, right? So there's, there's two broad trends that we need to talk about there. The first is that job growth has actually been dismal in Canada. Canada. And the second is that job quality 
continues to erode. So uh, talking about job creation, we heard from the Globe and Mail earlier this week, and it's something that we've been talking about a lot, is uh, that job creation is actually, we're in the longest streak of slow job growth that we've had since we started keeping track in the 1970s. So that's a huge, huge problem. Uh, this morning, Ed Broadbent alluded to the fact that we recovered our employment rate since uh, since the recession began. So if we were to do that, we'd actually need to be creating another 150,000 jobs tomorrow just to have the same share of prime-aged workers working that were working before the recession. So those are two, two big things. Uh, another is that our unemployment rate has actually gone up in the last few months. We're back at 6.8%. And the safety net for people who have lost their job, uh, whether it was just a short time ago or a longer time ago, uh, is also eroding, so uh, people don't have the same net that they used to. That's one important point. The other is that uh, quality jobs are not being created at the same rate as poorer quality jobs. And what does that mean? So we're looking for uh, we're looking at part-time work growing faster than full-time work. We're also seeing that industries that pay low wages, those jobs are growing faster than uh, middle-income and high-income jobs. Again, this morning, Ed Broadbent. Uh, pulled out this fact that 40% of all the jobs created between 2006 and 2014 were actually in the lowest paying sectors. 40% of all the jobs. So that's a huge, a huge uh, problem that we need to be looking at as well. So those are some brief stats of what's going on. And there are five things that I want you to keep in mind for the rest of this conversation about organizing, uh, organizing the unorganized. One is that everyone is worried about the underperforming labor market. It might be that you're worried about your own job uh, or you're worried about your daughter's job, your granddaughter's job. In fact, a lot of us might even be worried about our parents' jobs, which is something that probably hasn't uh, occurred very much in the past. So that's one. Two, Precarious work or non-standard work affects each of us differently. Some of us are facing temporary work, part-time work, no benefits, low wages, median wages haven't been increasing. So though this precarious work issue is growing, we all face different challenges within that. And that's important when we're talking about organizing uh, because we might not be organizing around the same policy necessarily. Um, three, non-standard work is seeping into new areas and new industries all the time. Recent research from York University is showing that even more industries are facing non-standard work, whether it's lower wages, um, we're looking at temporary work, those sorts of things. Four, different groups face precarious and non-standard work at different rates. So if you think about recent immigrants, women, Aboriginal peoples, racialized individuals, uh, they all face precarious work at a higher rate than uh, than white guys, basically. <laughs> Looking at all the other, at, uh, the, this list keeps on growing. This list keeps on growing. Um, and number five, the most important point is that it doesn't actually have to be this way. We don't have to have this growing, uh, precarious, non-standard environment. And that's kind of what we're here to talk about today: is how to organize around those things. So we're all facing, um, we're all facing growing, non-standard, and precarious work. But we could be looking at th to things and to policy policies where we could actually see improvements. And that would be looking at raising the minimum wage. We can talk about the growing living wage movement in Canada, we can look at employment standards, something that we're talking about a lot in Ontario. Uh, the list actually is quite long, and I think we'll be talking about more this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Bob Masters, the co-founder of the Working Families Party, he's the director of legislation, politics, and mobilization activity for District One of the Communications Workers of Ontario of America, <laughs> not Ontario. <laughs> we'll, we'll take Ontario. We'll take Ontario too. Ontario. <laughs> uh, which represents 160,000 members from New Jersey to Maine. Uh, thanks, Bob. Thank you. Um, I just want to make a couple of uh, brief points in response to President Trumpka's speech. Um, one thing that strikes me uh, very clearly is that. Uh, we in the United States feel like for the last 35 years we have been under a sustained, concerted, coordinated uh, corporate attack on our standard of living, on our labor rights, uh, on the structure of, of decent jobs, uh, deregulation, globalization, and so on. And I have a sense, uh, having been here 24 hours, uh, that where 
a little bit further down the timeline mm -hmm. than you are, right? We are now at 6.6% uh, union density in the private sector. If I'm not mistaken, yours is about triple that. Um, we're at 11.2% overall union density, and I think you're still at 30. And I think what's worth noting is that the speech that President Trump gave uh, would not have been given uh, by an American labor leader 25 years ago. Um, it is the experience of the crisis um, which has gotten to such uh, a grave point that has uh, engendered a change in the vision of the national labor leadership, um, which is that we are no longer able to defend the standard of living of our members going it alone. We must have a broader perspective. And so all of the things that, that he talked about, take for example the question of immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, the American AFL-CIO was exclusionist until 1995. Um, and so there has been a really profound shift. And still, I think the second point I would make is that the shift, even to this day, has a long way to go in terms of being driven down to the local union and the rank and file level. Because it's inherent in the day-to-day -day work or the day-to-day -day structure of a labor union that as an elected local union official, your first obligation is to look out for the immediate needs of your members, not necessarily to think about the unemployed uh, you know, uh, on the street nearby or the immigrant worker who's not a member of your union. Um, or in fact, many of the issues, mass incarceration, that, that President Trump has spoke about. And my admonition to my brothers and sisters here in the labor movement is, now is the time to begin building those relationships and to start taking up the tasks of reaching out more broadly, lest you find yourself 10 or 15 years from now in a situation like we find ourselves today, where we are increasingly fighting against being isolated. Say, for example, uh, in the public sector, where our uh, uniform services, our teachers, our public employees are the last people in their communities to have defined benefit pensions. And Governor Chris Christie, when he attacks the public workers in, in New Jersey, uh, can say, you know, New Jersey's divided into the haves and the have-nots, the teachers and state employees who have pensions and everybody else. Um, and so it's incumbent, I think, upon uh, the leaders of the Canadian labor movement uh, to understand that the crisis is coming. Our experience over the last 35 years is their goal is to eradicate us. This is not, there's no truce. There's no, there's no, like, we'll tolerate, you know, X percent, and that's what we're seeing with Walker in Wisconsin. We saw it with Snyder in Michigan. I mean, the idea that we have these so-called right-to-work states in, in places where you once were, had strongholds of industrial unionism is in some ways shocking. And finally, that brings us to the question of organizing new constituencies and precarious constituencies. We must make that commitment to invest. <laughs> and, and, and American unions are doing that now. I mean, the United Fruit and Commercial Workers is investing millions in, in building workplace organization uh, among uh, fast food workers, I mean, among uh, Walmart workers, SEIU, fast food workers, uh, CWA in all different kinds of constituencies, the UAW among adjunct and, and, and uh, uh, graduate teaching faculty. I mean, I, I, these are just the ones that come to mind. I think we've got to really invest, um, not necessarily knowing what the payoff is, Mm -hmm. And sometimes this is hard to communicate. We're taking your dues money, organized members, to invest in these almost speculative ventures, but that's what we need to do. And I agree, precarious work doesn't have to be precarious. Exactly. I'll close on one thing and then turn it over, which is the four Walton children are worth a total of $100 billion. The Walton workers, I mean, the Walmart workers can afford uh, they can afford to share a little bit of that wealth uh, with the Walmart workers. It's a political and social and economic decision, not a, uh, an act of God. Exactly.
And our last, uh, our last panelist, Dina Ladd, is the coordinator for the Workers' Action Centre. Dina is one of the founders and a coordinator uh, with, with the Toronto Bay Centre. Uh, the Centre is a membership-based uh, organization of workers who are facing low wages, precarious employment, uh, violations of rights and discrimination at work, and they are fighting to change those conditions. Thank you. Um, how are you doing? Good? <laughs> yes? All right, so I have a really hard time speaking when I'm sitting in an armchair, so if I get a bit fidgety, <laughs> because normally I'm standing and pacing up and down, so bear with me. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question. Um, who here thinks that if you're working full time that you shouldn't be living in poverty? Right? Okay. Who believes that if you are sick that you should be able to take a day off with pay? Yeah? Okay. Who here thinks that if you're hired through a temp agency and you're doing the same work alongside a permanent worker that you shouldn't be paid 40% less and you should get health and benefits? Yeah? All right. Okay, so I have these conversations in unionized settings and I have these conversations with non-unionized workers and the response I get is the same. Because everybody believes in decent work. That is a factor that unites us as working people in this country. And I think that we are at a point here where if we're not building bridges, if we're not understanding how to bring unionized workers and non-unionized workers together, then we're going to miss, and I think that Bob has just said, what's facing the states right now is, is our picture, okay? And I think that um, for a lot of non-unionized workers out there, the, the message is constantly, well, these unionized workers have pensions and, 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 and you don't. You know, they have all these benefits, you don't. And so the question is always the race to the bottom. And we need to turn that conversation around. We need to turn that conversation to, for, for workers that are, you know, who are really struggling right now to make ends meet, to say that if they have unions, if, unions, if unionized workers have pensions, why don't you? If unionized workers have sick days, why don't you? And that's the conversation that we need to be having, not how do we strip away all the benefits and all the kinds of rights that unionized workers have been fighting for for the last three or four decades and longer. But the thing is, is that that conversation is not going to happen unless we think through how to build our organizing efforts together. And I think that um, right now in Ontario, we have a, a really great opportunity. Uh, we have pushed our Ontario government to do a full review of employment standards, our basic legislation, and the Labor Relations Act. I think this is a chance for us to have an organizing, a collective bargaining fight for decent jobs in Ontario. And that's what I'm interested in organizing. And so I really hope that if you agree with some of those questions, that you're going to sign on to that collective bargaining campaign. Because that's what it is. And that's what it's going to take for unions. Because if a union in a retail store, in a grocery store, in, in a restaurant, in a place where they're organizing daycare workers, how are they going to fight for better sick days, for better scheduling, for better benefits, if there's no floor of protection? Because right now, there, there is no floor. There is massive gaps and, and nobody has any protection. We have 1.6 million people in Ontario that have no right to take an unpaid day off if they're sick or if they have to take care of their kid. 1.6 million. So of course they're not going to support uh, a union if they're fighting out contracting out and they're dealing with and they've got 20 sick days because you've got workers who have nothing. They have absolutely nothing. So I think uh, Mr. Trumka's remark about saying unions are going to have a harder fight at the bargaining table if the conditions on the ground are so bad is absolutely what we're seeing in the Canadian context. 
We have been decimated by the restructuring that's happened in our labor markets. Employers are completely avoiding their responsibility and liability for having a workforce. They're hiring agencies, subcontractors, brokers, leases, you name it, they're doing it. And it has been allowed to happen. The crisis is already here. We have only 40% of people um, so, sorry, 50% of people that have full-time jobs in, in the greater Toronto area. It's already happened, right? So we have a, a, a big challenge ahead of us, but absolutely now is the time so that we are not in a situation 20 years from now dealing with the absolute crisis that is in the US. We have to take these moments, we have to use strategically campaigns to bring union, unions and community groups to strategically fight to raise the floor for everyone and then let unions raise the bar. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sure. uh, thanks, Dina. So to, to maybe just to turn, it, uh, turn back to some of those questions. So, Thinking a little bit about union density in Canada, we know that it, it's dropped rather substantially and uh, Bob was just, just talking about that in the United States. We've managed to hold fairly, fairly consistent with some, some, some decline uh, in Canada. Um, where, where is the future of, of, of organizing to be able to continue to expand the labor movement's capacity and how, how especially can we, can we start to think about or which industries in particular do you think there's some opportunity to, to start to, to delve into? Uh, Kelly, do you want to start us off? Well, if we go back to that stat from earlier today that 40% of all of the jobs that have been created since 2006 are in the lowest paid sectors, those are also the sectors with the lowest bargaining power and we need to start looking there. And I agree with Dina completely that what we need to start doing is looking at raising the floor to make sure that every job in Ontario in Canada is going to be a good job or a better job for everyone. So looking in that sector is important. Um, I have heard that in Quebec, they're doing a really nice job with um, corner stores or like what used to be called Max Milk in, mm -hmm. in Ontario. That's something that's happening in Quebec and, and the unionization is happening there, but I'm not sure about any other, uh, any other stories at the moment. Well, I mean, I, th I think, um, I, I mean, I think there is, there's a lot of non-unionized workers out there. <laughs> um, I mean, in Ontario, we have six million. Um, so, I mean, I think that there are massive areas of, um, of sectors where we have, uh, it's not just even about the sectors, it's about the type of work though too. I mean, I think the thing is, is that if we are to sort of look at organizing, we have to take on how are we gonna organize temp agency workers? How are we gonna deal with workers who have multiple employers, right? Are hired by all of these subcontractors that are out there. And that's why it's so important to have a unionizing strategy, but also a strategy where the legislation um, holds the responsibility for the conditions of work at the top with these corporations that are absolutely driving down the wages and the working conditions. So if you're gonna have a retail strategy, for instance, how do you make sure the Walmarts and, and you know, um, I mean, we've missed the opportunity with Target, but uh, all those massive retailers at the top are completely responsible for the kinds of conditions that are happening at the bottom. We need to fight for fair scheduling. We need to fight for um, hours that people can, can live on. We need to fight for equal pay for equal work. Many part-time workers don't even have the same wages and benefits doing the same job as full-time workers. And so you've got a situation in the labor market where you've got entrenched inequality built into the way in which workplaces are divided, the ways in which precarious work have been entrenched systematically in sectors of cleaning, in driving, in trucking, in business services, um, in retail work. And so what we need to do is, I think, a strategy where we take on inequality as the root of, of how workers are being divided layered on with precarious employment, layered on with uh, a unionizing strategy and a legislative strategy that raises the floor. And I think we can take on all the sectors. I think we need to have a systematic approach and it means 
strong alliances. It means strong community and union uh, union uh, alliances working together, and um, and it needs a lot of discussion and and thinking through how this is going to happen with the resources behind it. Because workers are wanting unions. Workers are wanting better working conditions. They don't want to work at 17% uh, below the poverty line. They don't want to be working two or three jobs. They don't want to be living in debt. They want better work, right? So people are ready. It's, it's, it's our responsibility to respond to that. Bob? I mean, um... There's a lot of really interesting work being done in the States Absolutely. on these things right now. Um, I, and in all the areas that you're talking about, in terms of retail workers, in terms of uh, the Taxi Drivers Alliance is the first non-traditional union to be directly affiliated with the AFL-CIO. It's an association of uh, almost entirely immigrant uh, taxi workers, like 20,000 in New York City. And spreading, we're doing, CWA is doing that in New Jersey now as well. Um, I think that the truth is we don't know how and when and where the breakthrough, the, the upsurge will come. Um, I think we should remember that, you know, in an, you know, in an analogous sense in the 1930s, the traditional AFL-CIO leadership said the first and second generation immigrant workers in the factories were unorganizable, right? They were written off. And it was, the, you know, the visionaries of the CIO who said, no, we're going to make the investment, we're going to try, we're going to take on General Motors, the largest corporation in America at the time. And so I think we've got to try all these experiments, and at the same time, I do think we have to make an effort to shift the overall ideological frame of the society. I, and I think your society is in a little bit better shape than we are. I listened to Thomas Mulcair and uh, wish we had more spokespeople like him uh, to articulate a different vision. But, you know, we have lived for 30 years in America in the yo-yo, you're on your own society. We need to be in the we're all in this together society. And people have to, un have to come to an understanding. And this is, this, is, this is actual work. This is, you know, what I like to think that the Working Families Party in New York and, and across the country in about 10 states is trying to do is to change the political and ideological frame so that people start to imagine these alternative possibilities. I think that individualistic mentality, though, is very much here as well, and I think that, that we see that in our workplaces too, where um, you know the unionized workers are, are looking at the non-union or the temps, and it's all about you know, am I all right? And you know, if I'm okay, then you know, I, I've just got to take care of my family. And so I think that the how, how do you, how do we encourage? a culture of organizing, right? And I think that that's really, um, because in Canada, we, we, we don't have the kinds of movements on the ground in, in, I think, that we see in the States. We don't have as many worker centers. We don't have as many immigrant rights groups. Um, I think that uh, we need to be developing um, forms of organizing that, that, are, that help create that sort of independent self-organizing. We're starting to see that in Ontario. We have uh, a, a, a migrant workers coalition. We have uh, farm workers organizing. We have uh, domestic workers organizing. We're starting to see that self-organizing happening as the crisis deepens in our communities. And I think that that's where those powerful alliances could really help you know, build and sustain and flourish that, that work on the ground. So let's let's keep on that on that on that frame in uh, in terms of thinking a bit about some of the solutions. We've talked a lot about the, the problems that exist in terms of organizing and, and and why. What are some of the solutions, especially thinking a bit about about younger workers, about racialized communities, those who are who are, are, are struggling significantly in our society? What do you think some of the tactics are, or best practices that we could employ? Maybe uh, Bob, do you want to take that first? That's a challenging one. I mean, I think. Um... I don't, I, I don't really have an easy answer to that. I, don't, I can't point to a particular tactic. My general belief is the labor movement really has to um, walk the talk when it comes to uh, engaging with and supporting the struggles of those constituencies. The labor movement has to be seen as not just paying lip service to the idea that we're fighting for all workers, but to engage in those struggles that matter most to those constituencies, to young people, to people of color, and so on. And so, um, so it, to me, it's an overall orientation. I'm not, you know, those struggles go on, and I think the labor movement has to show up in those struggles. 
Uh, I mean, I, I think that one of the uh, exciting strategies that I, I see in Ontario is um, a basis of unity that we're um, that we're building called the Fight for 15 and Fairness, if you haven't already noticed by my T-shirt. <laughs> um, I'm a big walking ad for it right now. Um, but uh, I mean, part of it is, is not only saying, um, is providing inspiration uh, and saying to young people that this is something that we can fight for instead of always having to defend cuts, um, you know, trying to protect what we have. Why, why don't we start having a conversation around what we want to fight for? Just earlier this week, um, we did about uh, three sessions at George Brown College with, with about 100 young people, and I, and I had a conversation with, with them about saying, okay, so what's your vision of a decent job? Let's, let's talk about that. So we wrote it all up on the board, and then I said, so is there anything different about your vision for a decent job uh, than, your, than your parents? And they basically said, no, really, there's not. And so I said, well, let's look at what you're, you're dealing with. And so everyone who's working right now because of tu high tuition fees um, was talking about, you know, crappy schedules, um, low wages, having to be fully available for work and not getting enough hours and all of the kinds of things that we're talking about. And, and so then it's like, well, then what next? Do we just walk away? Or do we allow, do we have a campaign? Do we have a strategy that then can engage people in that? And that's what the Fight for 15 is all about. It's about saying, you don't have to be a union worker. You don't have to be part of um, a, an organization. You can get involved in this vision for decent work because it's about fighting for fair hours. It's about fighting for fair scheduling. All the kinds of issues that people have identified that they want to fight for. And so I think we really need to be finding strategies where um, the person on the street, the retail work, all the people who are isolated and marginalized in their work because they're not involved in any organization can actually see themselves as part of the labor movement and that there's a way for them to actually get involved and organize because a lot of people feel that they don't know how to engage with all of these movements that are happening. But if you just have a conversation with workers about what they're facing, and then there's a campaign that they can get involved in, mm -hmm. it's it's um, I think it's it's easy, you know it's a lot easier than than trying to make people join an organisation first, yeah. and, and prescribing how they have to be involved, what they have to do before they can even just start to get inspired about the fight back. Cer certainly, there's. Uh, I've been finding I've been finding that when I go out and give talks as well that a lot, often uh, workers, young workers particularly, feel really demoralized and they don't even know that solutions are out there and that uh, a different way of working and organizing is possible. And all of a sudden, you stand there and say, "Here are all of the different ways that you could get involved. Here are all of the different ways that work used to be better." Why don't we start fighting for those? And, and people are going, oh, I had no idea that I could even fight for that. I didn't know it was a possibility. So it's time to start talking about possibilities. The problem is very well defined. I think it's also about giving people um, credit where credit's due. I think mm -hmm. that uh, one of the conversations that came up in the inequality session today was, you know, people people automatically think, oh, those poor workers, they're, they're, they're struggling with two or three jobs, they're living in poverty, they have no time to get involved, and, and, and it becomes this very paternalistic approach that we take to campaign building, where we feel that we need to do it for people. And I'd say that's a lot of crap, because I think people are very well capable of doing it for themselves, and they're more militant and they're more ready to take action. And, and I'll say to you that, you know, I get inspired every day, like I have one of our members at the Workers Action Center, she's trying to put herself through college. She's the main breadwinner. Uh, she has to take care of her dad and her uh, brother who has uh, disabilities. She works, and get, so get this, she works Friday 16 hours a day at a group home, Saturday 16 hours at that same group home, and Sunday 16 hours. So she does 48 hours in three days. She's hired through a temp agency. She gets paid minimum wage at 11 bucks an hour. The rest of the workers are getting paid 23 bucks an hour. She's told by the temp agent she's an independent contractor, so she doesn't get any access to labor rights. And she has to pay the temp agency a 7% fee for the privilege of working. So you tell me, <laughs> how is that person going to get involved in the labor movement, right? Without having a, a campaign or a place where 
she can find organizers that look like her, that, uh, and she's Bangladeshi, but we have a multiracial membership, but how do we organize so that racialized communities see themselves a part of the struggle? Because they don't have to just keep explaining what they're facing, but they've got people who are working with them and, and they are themselves organizing alongside, um, not having done for them, but being able to be part of that struggle and quite capable of doing it for themselves. And that's what we also have to support. So, so uh, sadly, that leaves us with more questions uh, and, uh, and, and no, more, uh, more, more, or more, more, uh, more questions to, to, <laughs> to answer. Um, but that's all the time that we have. So just wanted to thank Dina and Bob and Kaylee for their time. And, uh, and thanks, everyone.